Do you remember Gigapets? How about the Macarena? Furby? Beanie Babies? Pogs? Tickle Me Elmo? Pokemon? Care Bears? How about the Baby on Board signs? Pet Rocks? Black Lights? Well, some of these things we actually enjoyed, loved, at least for a time. You still, you may still have some of these things in your attic or your garage, but most of us have moved, moved on from those things, right? Because they were a fad. A fad is something that is a practice or an interest that's followed with zeal, right? With vigor, with... Um, excitement that is just a trend it's in vogue for a time it's a it's a fashion that comes and goes right it's a short-lived fashion usually and i wanted to talk about this and why i'm bringing this up is you're like well, where's where's he going with this is because it's something we loved absolutely loved it's a passion right on some of these things and yet it's not fervent in our heart anymore. God's love is not like that. His love is not like a fad. It's not a fashionable, trendy love for a time and then moves on. Something that became popular in the 70s that I didn't realize, but when I was doing a little research on this, I picked it up. You ladies probably remember this was the gunny sack dresses it's a tote bag dress or a toe bag dress in the 70s this was actually in illinois that a lady was going through a shop wanting to find something back in the 70s it was kind of uh didn't like the trends that were out there but during that time, you know, they would cover the mannequins in between seasons. Like if you had a mannequin that you usually use for swimsuits or whatever. You'd and they covered it in a gunny sack. Cut out arms and a head and kind of cinched it up there. And she goes, oh, I would love a dress out of that. And she bought the gunny sack and they made a dress for her. And other patrons that came in began to ask for the same thing, hearing what she said. And some of them are actually quite nice. Gunny sack is just, it's something that you carried something in, like potatoes or something. It's just a coarse fabric. Could be made out of like hemp or burlap. But it's, so it doesn't really appeal. You wouldn't think at first it would, it would make sense as a fad or something you'd want to wear. And I think some people could still pull it off. And in some cases, they're still being sold, which is fantastic because it's a trend that kind of stayed for a while, right? I think some people grew old, tired of it. But think about God's love. It doesn't become trendy even though you might be embarrassed in it. Like if some lady was wearing a gunny sack, some people might put her down. A gunny sack dress, right? Others might go, oh, that's retro, that's trendy, that's nice. But when you feel embarrassed about what you have or what you own or what you kind of put value in, that can embarrass you and cause you to drop it off, right? I'm not going to wear that again. <clears throat> We're in Christ. We're chosen in Christ. We're seated in heavenly places. We're associated with Christ. We're followers of Christ. We're devoted to Christ. We're supposed to be actually emulating Christ, but oftentimes we're very embarrassing to Him. Yet His love remains consistent for us. It's not trendy. It's not fashionable. And when we, even when we embarrass Him, He loves us. And we need to learn that because some people will throw us off like a fad. If we embarrass them, they're no longer our friend. They no longer love us, right? But Jesus is not like that. Even in the midst of incredible embarrassment, like Peter, and Peter when in um, 
Luke chapter 22, after three years of training, after three years of seeing miracles, three years of declaring Jesus and witnessing for him and going out and sharing the gospel, Jesus warned him that he was going to deny himself. He was, G, Peter was going to deny Jesus. And here's what it says in Luke 22, 31 through 34. And the Lord said to him, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he, Peter, said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he said to him, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you know me. You might not think this is embarrassing, but if you are the Messiah, if you are trying to convince people that you're the real deal. I think the people closest to you would have the greatest influence on helping people understand that. But when one betrays you and all the rest flee from you and one denies you three times to the public and to the leadership, uh, in the midst of the leadership of Israel, that's incredibly embarrassing, isn't it? That's not the way to prove that you're the Messiah or to gain followers, is to have the people, people closest to you walk away from you, betray you, or deny you. And that could be incredibly embarrassing. Yet God's love is so amazing. I love John chapter 13 at the end and starting at 14. Remember, there's no chapter break, so let me read that. It's kind of the same scene, but we get a little more insight into it. John 13, 38 through 14, 3, Jesus answered and said, will you, will you lay down your life for my sake, Peter? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. But let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This is incredible. Peter, you're going to deny me. You're going to deny me three times. You're going to deny me to my face. You're going to deny me all this in one night. But don't let your heart be troubled. Why does he say that? Don't think I'm going to stop loving you. This is where our heart gets us in trouble because we equate human honesty, human vulnerability, human frailty to God. Like, you, th you say it now, but you're, you're not going to follow through, right? So you're honest now, you promise, but you're not going to do it. Jesus is not Peter. Jesus is not like one of the other fads I hope is a fad is, like these reality shows like The Bachelor, where they fake this kind of love to win the prize of getting married. And I don't think, I, I don't know, maybe you know, but I don't think any one of those relationships have lasted from that. You're just happy that the person I'm rooting for was the person this person picked. But it's not a honest love, a true love. And Christ is different. And he says, Peter, don't let your heart be troubled. So when you think you failed God, you've been an embarrassment. Don't feel that God has abandoned you. He loves you. He may correct you like he did Peter. He may challenge you. Um, but He's always going to tell you, don't be afraid. I don't want your heart troubled that you think that I'm just going to throw you to the side like, you know, some 70s or 80s fad. 
and there you are, like a tie-dye shirt thrown, not in the wash anymore, but in the trash. He loves us through thick and thin. Even in the most embarrassing moments that we could have in our relationship, He loves you. He loves you dearly. I like Psalm 138, 8. It says, The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. The psalmist is pleading this because the psalmist is going through these feelings. You're not going to finish your work because you're just growing tired of me, Lord. You're growing tired of my promises that I don't keep. You're growing tired of me not measuring up. You're growing tired. God's not that way. He loves you. And He will continue to work on you. And, and He loves, He has hands of mercy. Hands of strength. He will mold us. But they're merciful. It's not an apathetic love that He has. He's not here one moment and then, then throw it away. That's what happens with fads. You really love it. Then, then it's not that you hate it. You just become indifferent towards it, right? Uh, it goes in the closet. It goes away. I'm disinterested. I'm, I'm not involved with it anymore. And this is something where they lose popularity. But you don't lose your popularity with the Lord. In Hosea 2.19 it says, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I love this. I'm going to betroth you to me in these things. He's not just saying, when you are righteous, when you are perfectly just, I will love you. He's saying, in his promises, he's righteous. In his justice, he will do right by you. And in his loving kindness and mercy, that's how he's going to treat you. Not toss you aside, not, you know, put you in the attic or the closet or the basement or the garage or the storage shed or the rental storage place, you know. Oh, I forgot Scott was there as he was digging back in the 10 by 10, you know. Is it worth renting this place to store Scott there anymore? I'm never in there because he loves me so much. It's not like things like, um, well, some of these keep coming back because of marketing, but think about troll dolls or about disco music. And along with disco music, platform shoes or polyester suits. God's not like that. Like, well, I only think of you when the trends seem to come all the way around and maybe marketing or you know, you present yourself to me again and I get these feelings for a moment like you find that Rubik's Cube, you know, and you're like, oh, well, I remember solving this and how cool this was, right? And then it's not long after that you, you can't solve it and you, it goes back into the junk drawer. Um, he's not like that. He, he loves us. In Psalm 41, 12... It says this, As for me, you uphold me in my integrity and set me before your face forever. God's love is not apathetic. We're set before Him. We're set before His face forever. We're not tossed over in the corner. We're not in that shoebox at the top shelf of the closet. We are something that's there it's something of pride and joy. Like somebody puts it out right there, center stage, on my desk, because I want to look at it and see it every day, because I love it so much. I have nothing but fond memories and, and love in my heart. We're not some object, but what I'm, you know where I'm getting at, is we're not secondary to Him. We're primary before His face, and God upholds us. And we are dearly loved. It's not a fashionable love. It's not an apathetic love. It is a dying love. Think about this. He died for us. 
He loves us that much. What does he get in return? Our love, but in our fellowship, but it's not like we're eternal and it's not like we are in prayer 24 7 it's not like we offer as much i mean it god loves it but when you compare god to us and what we have to offer compared to what he has to offer us we're kind of paupers aren't we into what we can offer him he loves it but when you have that perspective right so if you were looking at something a lot of these fads or trends or things that went the wayside they went the wayside because of functionality they were fun they functioned but something better came along or something that worked better or something that we we pretended it worked but it really wasn't something that was practical like let me give you an example eight tracks eight tracks came and went right Lava lamps, they're fun to look at. You can still buy them. They don't, they're not really a lamp, right? They don't give off much light. They're just fun to look at. Mood rings, they don't really tell you your mood. They kind of fluctuate with the temperature of your body. And they're not really telling you if you're passionate or if you are, you know, angry or you know, your blue mood, and, and there's this falseness to some of these things, right? They lose their ability to help you, or there's something better that comes along. They get passed down the line. They get set, set on the technology shelf, and the idea with God is that he doesn't see us as becoming obsolete or useless. We are practical 24-7 to him. We're created in his image. He loves us dearly and it isn't because the function. So if you're like, but I'm not a leader, I'm not a pastor, I haven't evangelized all these people, God doesn't love me, I'm not a prophet, I'm not son of a prophet I don't even work for an you know I work for a nonprofit organization he loves you well I'm just a housewife or I'm just you know somebody working in a factory I'm just he loves you you're incredibly valuable to him he died for us and he chose you before he even died for you in Ephesians 1 3 through 6 it says Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him. In love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which he made us acceptable or accepted in the beloved. He's chosen us to be in him, in his son. He chose us out of his love. We're not some pathetic being. We're created in his image. So get that out of your mind. This whole idea of worm mentality that mankind is worthless, useless, vermin hated by God from birth that's not scriptural it doesn't mean we're we're necessarily worthy of saving or that we could save ourselves but we are created in his image and we are a tre- he calls us a treasure we should not call ourselves other things and because of that he chose us to be blameless He made it so as he looks at us, he can look at us through rose-colored glasses, glasses that are purchased by the shed blood of his son on the cross so that he could see us as perfect as his son. So when we look at ourselves, we see things in ourselves and some things we loathe, many things we can enjoy and God has transformed us and it's beautiful. We tend to look on the 
saltier side, right? We tend to look on the on on the side that's not so good and condemn ourselves. But who are you, all men, to condemn another person's servant? You should confess your sins before God and let Him deal with it, not walk around acting like He doesn't love you when He does, because it's a lie. It's a lie from our own flesh. It's a lie from the enemy. He loves you. He loves you dearly. He paid that price for us when we were yet sinners and enemies. How much more when we're reconciled to Him? Scripture says that. Romans 5.10 says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son much more having been reconciled shall we be saved by his life I love scripture and the contrast teaching of more than less than right if he loved you when you were less than this when you were enemies if he would die for you who would die for an enemy right? In World War II, would American soldiers go out and die for Nazis, for Mussolini's hitmen, for the SS? No. Because they're your sworn enemy. They, they are doing evil things, killing people, using their skin as lampshades. That's hideous. Why would you die for such a person? Yet Christ died for us when we were yet enemies. So how much more that you're now reconciled does he love you? How much more does he give himself to you? How much more do you need to hear before you realize he loves me so dearly? Hold your chin up high. I don't care what this world is, is shoveling over to us. What's coming on the pike? Who's going to get elected? Jesus is Lord and he loves you. He's the king of kings and he oversees all people, all officials, all governors, all mayors, presidents, Kremlin leaders, right? Soviet leaders. It don't matter. He loves us. And he doesn't worry about compensation. He doesn't worry about trendiness. You see emojis, you know, on your phone, it's on every social media, and you have the smiley face. You know, that was created back in 1963 by H.R. Ball. He had a um, client who came to him, and, and he did advertising and stuff. And the client said, you know, what can I do just in my offices that will kind of raise morale, that will kind of cheer people up. And so he came up, Mr. Ball came up with the smiley face. And he sold it for a whopping $45 at the time. He didn't trademark it though. And it's been used on millions and millions of different items. It's used on uh, all kinds of technology now, social media, right? It was actually made it to a U.S. stamp. You, you can, um, you know, collect their collectibles, U.S. stamps. Highly collectible, actually, for with the smiley face. And you would think, man, if this person should have been compensated for doing that. $45 doesn't seem appropriate for all the things that went on, all, all the items that were sold over, over all these decades, right, that this person should have been <laughs> a millionaire many times over. And he would be bitter and angry, and he could have been, I don't know. But with Christ, he isn't compensated near what he gave, right? It doesn't bother him. Because his compensation, he looks as you at you as a million bucks. You're the pearl of great price. You're the treasure of the field that he would give everything for. And it never gets old to him. Matter of fact, he's just getting started. He's got all eternity with us. And so I, I want to wrap this up with 
let's keep it short, but the idea here is that I don't want you to think of God's love as being trendy. It's permanent. It's everlasting. It's deep. It's committed. It's a committed love that that will follow you around. It's a love that is enduring. It's a love that's sincere. It's a love that has integrity. It's a love that is always excited about you. And really, that's how we should treat one another, isn't it? You've got a spouse, you've got a friend, you've got a community. Even people who are not in your community. Treat them with respect. Treat them with love. Treat them as created in the image of God. And in doing so, you can't go wrong. It's the right thing to do, isn't it? Because He died for all. All are seen as his treasure, but the ones who actually come to him get to be loved in close, close proximity in a relationship as his treasure. And if you've never done that, if you've never accepted him, if you don't understand his love, then I invite you to, to accept him and to trust in his, his payment on the cross for your sins. And then to become and say, you chose me for the foundation of the world. I'm choosing you back and I want to follow you. So be my Lord, be my teacher, be my master, be my trainer. And if you do that, you've entered into this, this relationship with him. It's basically a marriage contract. It's a love relationship. I'm choosing to respect you, to accept your love. And that's it. If you choose to do that, ask Him into your heart. Ask Jesus, and you'll be saved. And you'll receive a tremendous love. All right, till next week, God bless you. Um, go, go in your closet and pull out those things. Maybe a pet rock. And then uh, it'll, be, it'll be lots of fun, right? See you next week. God bless.